Well, um, just wanted to say thank you. My name is Catherine Garcia. Um, I'm the executive director of MVC Live Arts and um, wanted to say thank you to Venture Cafe. We're really excited to partner with them um, in this last month um, to kind of rethink what live arts is online. <laughs> uh, we are a 30-year-old 30 30 year organization um, that has been kind of a fixture in, in the cultural community, bringing um, performances in live theater, music, and dance from all around the world um, here to Miami, and also um, cultivating work um, on our own soil with local artists as well. Um, and this has definitely been a moment for us to rethink how we do that, and we've been really pleased to have this platform to um, bring some interesting workshops and conversations to the table. Um, today, we are doing a talk uh, in honor of Mother's Day. We have a lot of, a lot of mothers. People always say MDC Live Arts were just one big... <laughs> We've had pregnancies over the years with different staff. We're, we're constantly um, with motherhood in our midst. And um, so we really did want to do something special for the occasion. Um, this is also part of an initiative this season that we started called Ecocultura, Performances for the Planet. Um, and essentially it's trying to bring attention to the issue of climate change through the window of the arts um, for people to learn about it and pay attention to what's going on through a different um, angle. We hear a lot of the, the news and catastrophe and doom and gloom and that's all real, <laughs> it's all out there. Um, but there's definitely um, different ways to approach the subject and we really feel strongly that the arts have a lot to contribute in that area. And quite honestly, with the problem being as big as it is, we need all hands on deck, everyone on participating. And that means everyone brings the skills that they have to the table, including artists and presenters like ourselves. So, um, you know, I thought it was interesting when I was thinking about this, that when I look back, Eco Cultura, is actually a program that was born out of motherhood as well. <laughs> because I was just coming up, I have three kids myself and the youngest is just turning two this tomorrow actually. And um, I was just coming off of a maternity leave when um, we were planning for this season. And when I got back to work, I just, you know, sometimes in maternity leave, I think I went down a, a rabbit hole. I've been, to, been down that rabbit hole in the past of like, toxicity with my child and you know all of the the concerns that come when you become a parent um and i think with each child it just got deeper and deeper um and with this one in particular it may also just have been the times and the news cycle that we were in that you know climate crisis became even more present in my mind um and when i got back to work i thought well if i'm going to be away from my child i've got to be able to do something I can feel is really concrete um, for my kids' future. So um, again, with the tools we had, which is um, the arts, we wanted to start this initiative. And one of the first things that we did um, as part of Eco Cultura is we put a call out to artists locally. We did um, a process through our artists in residence program named LALA, the Live Arts Lab Alliance, um, to look for six local artists to create new work around the issue. And we have one of those artists with us here to, today, this evening, um, this afternoon, however you see it. Um, and her name is Sandra Portal Andreu, and um, she is a dancer, um, a beloved dancer in our community, a, a faculty at New World School of the Arts, and um, she's been participating in the cohort since January. Uh, she's working on a project in particular that we wanted to have a conversation around because her project is really centered around the voices of children um, and asking children a series of questions about how they envision their future in Miami and creating a work around that. So Sandra, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, and we are also really pleased to have Jane Gilbert, who is the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Miami. Um, and I forgot to mention, Sandra is a mom herself. Uh, I think it was, are they seven and 10? Seven and 10. Seven and, 10. and Sandra's also a mom. I'm sorry, not Sandra, Jane. <laughs> Jane is also a mom. Uh, teenagers though, right, Jane? 
Yes, 14 and 16. 14 and 16. So we're all at different ends of the spectrum there. Um, and has been working in environmental issues her whole life, now tackling kind of the mother of them all here in Miami <laughs> with being ground zero for um, climate change, um, the effects of climate change, which we all know so well living here. Mm -hmm. um, and Charge is really coming up with a resiliency plan and adaptation plans and mitigation plans for our future. Um, and Sandra also has an arts background, uh, having worked with Arts for Learning and um, has also worked with youth uh, with programs like Dream and Green. So we're just really pleased to have you both with us here today. We definitely want this conversation to be as interactive as possible. Um, so please feel free, everyone who's here, to put questions into the chat. Um, this is really just a, a conversation about what it means for us as mothers and parents um, to think about our kids' future within the context of climate change and what we can do um, to, to improve <laughs> what the future um, may hold for us um, and for our kids. So um, I'm just going to start it off with a question for Sandra and Jane. Oh, before I do that, I also want to just recognize some members of the MDC Live Arts team that are here that will also be participating in the, in the conversation. Jenny Person is here, our managing producer, also happens to be a, um, uh, the parenting columnist <laughs> uh, for Biscayne Times, a mother herself of two um, teenagers. And, um, Eddie Davis, and, and who's managing all of this on the technical end, and, and David McDougall, who is our Ecocultura community organizer, um, mm -hmm. and the, one of the founding members of the Miami Climate Alliance, who helps us really connect what we do with the environmental community and what's happening on the ground. So thank you everyone for being here. I'm just gonna kick it off with a question um, around uh, really, for me, one of the core issues are what are those what are the, you know, mom worry is such a natural thing, <laughs> um, but in this context, it kind of just gets magnified by a million percent. So I'm just curious for Jane and um, Sandra, what are the, the, the driving forces behind the anxiety around this issue for you as a parent? And um, how does that inform your work? Um, being a parent with those anxieties, how does that inform your work? And maybe even vice versa, how does your work inform your parenthood? Um, I, Jane, do you want to go? I'll go first, I guess. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, well, okay, so this is like a really tough question because I mean, definitely as an artist, um, and I, I'm, I'm very much a viewer. I, I absorb, I constantly am taking a look at my environment to sort of inspire me, inspire my work, um, whether it be through um, you know, current um, information on the news or even um, current state of affairs or, or trends, um, those things tend to uh, sort of inspire me. And then, then I sort of take that information and then I sort of place it in the context of, of my, 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 my surroundings, my life, my well-being, my, even my past. Um, memories and whatnot. And, and so in, in some ways that sort of shapes a lot of the work that I do. Um, the last piece that I, well, I don't want to say the last piece because it's still an evolving piece, um, dealt with immigration and it was uh, generally inspired by my grandmother. Um, so that sort of hit close to home. Um, with this new work that I'm, that I'm sort of researching and discovering, I, I, really wanted to place the, the voices. I was more inspired, if anything, from my children um, and more so on conversations that I've had in the past with my husband. Um, you know, we watch a lot of uh, reports, documentaries. Um, there's really a lot of information that's out there and available um, that, that tells us sort of like the state that we're in and where we're going in terms of like the climate, in terms of you know, everything, the planet. And, and a lot of the conversations that my husband and I have had are uh, really revolve around our worries um, for the future of our children and whether we see them, you know, being able to live in Miami 
in, in 20 and 30 years. So based upon that conversation, I personally was inspired to create a new work for um, Lala, for the Eco Cultura series that um, is sort of a reflection of those conversations that I've had with my husband, but now sort of bringing it to the forefront and asking my children, um, asking them questions on what they perceive climate change to be, on what, um, you know, how they feel about it and how they sort of maybe will envision their future in 20 or 30 years. And, and uh, that's pretty much where I'm sort of driving that information. And I'm really interested in, um, you know, interviewing and, and doing more research on other kids in the community because, you know, what my kids might be informed with because of information maybe that I've, you know, taken in and, and conversations that have, I have had with them, maybe some other kids aren't as informed and that's okay. You know, that's totally fine. I, but I, it's, you know, I'm sure at some level, they're all getting an inkling of what climate change is or um, what sea level rise means. Uh, but I'm interested in seeing what their perception is on that and then drawing all of that information to create this work. Thank you. Um, I'm kind of curious, we can come back to this question because I know it's part of this conversation, but like how you even talk to your kids about this issue is also kind of daunting, right? Depending on their age and I'm sure it changes depending <laughs> where they're at. But I mean, at the end of the day, they're the ones um, who are really going to be living with the strongest impacts of this and how do we get to prepare them for that? Um, uh, I know we'll come back to that. That's kind of a central thing. Um, but Jane, did you have any um, yeah, comments on sure. how your parenting influences your work and vice versa? Yeah, so first I, I would say, given that I became a parent the year I turned 41 uh, and had probably 20 years of work experience before being a mom, I would say first I, I'll, I'll talk about sort of how work has influenced how I parent. and. And as, as you mentioned earlier, I've worked both in the arts and education and environmental work. And I think um, the arts are so powerful for, for any human, child or adult, to, to find their voice, to, to find different ways of uh, expressing themselves. And, um, and then my work in in environmental education and now advocacy, now advocacy inside a government, but both inside and outside. Um, it, it, it's, 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 it's another way of giving voice. And, and so I, I, I really encourage that in my children in terms of finding ways for them to understand how they can have agency. And that's why I think Sandra's work is so great for them to, to, to hear their voices. So that how they can have agency, whether it's through a citizen science event or um, volunteering in, in ecosystem restoration or, um, or, or, or doing an, arts to express their concern, I think it's really important for them to, to have a sense of hope and a sense of visioning. And I think, I think on the other side, how it's, um, how my becoming a parent has shifted things, certainly it's uh, solidified my commitment to this work, right? So many times I hear people say, well, this is the problem that, that our future generation needs to solve. Well, we can't just, I couldn't just tell that to my kids, right? Like, I need to be part of the solution myself. And yeah. I'm not going to just dump this on you. Our, I feel like, you know, society's dumping so much on our future generation yeah. already that it is so critical for me to be able to feel that I'm doing what I can with the tools, the talents, whatever, the passions that I have to um, create a brighter future for them and then the trajectory that sometimes it looks like we're on. So, and I fell in love with Miami. I fell in love, I came to Miami working in the arts and 
I think that's one of the best ways to enter Miami in terms of meeting people and, and just uh, feeling a sense of the vibrancy and the culture in, in Miami. But, um, uh, and it's the only place my kids have ever known. And uh, in terms of their home, it's their home. It's the only place they've lived. And so I want them to be able to live here. And that's certainly helps when I go through Working in local government can be very frustrating at times. Uh, we have a lot of, you know, two steps forward, three steps back, and then moving forward again. And it, it can be very frustrating. And I think some of the things that get me up again in the morning to try again is looking at my kids. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I, I couldn't agree more with the point about it's not just for future generations. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, that just they, angers me. I don't know. Yeah. Just... <laughs> and, and I mean, you know, a lot of people say, I mean, they will, come up with better, they will come up with better solutions, probably, and yeah. faster. And, you know, yeah. yes, but, but it's not like, okay, let, let them figure it out. Because we, right. there, and we there's fail. still kids right now. There's still kids right now. And there's things right. we have to figure out and right now weird. as well that impact <laughs> decades down the line. Sandra, I was thinking about your blog post when Jane was speaking, um, when she was talking about this idea of, you know, only living in Miami, what makes Miami Miami. She, Sandra wrote a great blog post, Eddie. I don't know if we, we have the link for that, actually, but um, on our website at mdclivearts.org, she wrote, you know, we need a new planet mom <laughs> blog about this entire subject and, and tackling with the idea of, okay, well, if we had to move, where would we move? Do you want to tell them about that, Sandra? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I've actually had these conversations with my kids um, and they've been, um, you know, they always look at me with this strange face. Like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't want to leave Miami. Um, and I granted, they have their friends here, they have their family here, but you know, sometimes, you know, we say, well, you know, if, if we had to leave, I've actually had, I've actually asked them this question. I said, you know, if we had to leave, where would you like to go? And they were just, they kind of like look at me with this face, like, what do you mean? I don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> and, and they're like, well, why can't we just stay here? And, and I'm like, well, you know, I mean, we could stay here, but there is a likelihood that there might be some issues down the road. And, you know, um, so I don't, yeah, that definitely the conversations have been had. My son is super into the environment. He wants to be a zoologist, an anthropologist, an archaeologist. I mean, I don't know. It's anything that deals with animals. He's very much into it. And, and, you know, he, when I had the actual conversation, the, the interview with him, um, to start the project off, which I started officially on Earth Day, um, you know, he, he kept on saying, you know, we need to protect the planet, mom, because I'm afraid that there's, you know, the animals are going to go extinct. And if the animals go in extinct, um, then we might go extinct. And, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of these sort of um, statements that I found were, were really, um, I don't know, coming from a 10 year old. And this is something that I mentioned that. in my blog is that, yeah, I, I didn't think about that at 10 years old. I was, again, very much into New Kids on the Block, Stay by the Bell, and <laughs> you know, my ballet classes. That was, that was pretty much it, watching some cartoons on Saturday mornings and um, just kind of, you know, and not saying that my kids don't enjoy that. They do. They definitely see their cartoons and all that. But at the same time, you know, posing those questions, they're definitely aware. Um, that there's something happening, you know? Um, and one of the things that to me is um, somewhat sad is, you know, last summer, um, you know, they wanted to go outside and play. And it was a, there was a moment that I thought to myself, wow, when I was a child, I played outside all the time. Like it was all the time. And, and I remember being outside for hours and yeah, it was hot, it was hot but, Somehow we were able to play outside for a, a really long time. And um, a couple times last summer, I tried to take the kids outside and 
it would be like maybe two or three o'clock in the afternoon and they would last maybe 20 minutes. They were like, I, I, it's too hot. We have to go inside. So that sort of triggered something in my head as well, where I was thinking, you know, that isn't that weird? How did I spend all my afternoons outside and these guys can't spend 20 minutes, you know, it's, I don't know. And, and the, the heat is real, Jane, no? I mean, uh, is the city oh, yeah. <laughs> dealing yeah. with the traffic yeah, of that? And it's, it's well documented. We had, over the last 50 years, we have on average 75 more days a year over 90 in Miami. Um, so we definitely have, and even just the first quarter uh, this year was was one of the highest on record, but we keep hitting heat records. Over the last decade, we've been hitting numerous heat records that then supersede the next heat record. So, um, you know, we're blessed being on the water so that that has a cooling effect. So we're not like Phoenix, we don't get 105 degree weather, although with humidity, it can feel that hot, but um, we don't get some of the as intense high temperatures, but um, but it can feel pretty hot, particularly if you live farther away from the bay or the ocean and you don't have any trees in your neighborhood or whatnot. That can be, you can have a dramatic difference in the temperature um, by 10 degrees, 10, 15 degrees by where you are in Miami. Mm -hmm. so we're working on that. We're, we're going to be doing a citywide mapping of heat islands this summer. Oh, wow. So, yeah. I had a question for Jane. <laughs> yeah, please. Um, yes. <laughs> um, you know, with the city of Miami, um, you know, being sort of like ground zero and stuff, I'm sort of interested to hear, and I'm sure other individuals are probably interested to hear what the city of Miami and Miami Beach and um, what kind of plans they're putting together for like sea level rise. I know there's probably a lot, <laughs> yeah. but you know, um, maybe some examples of things that-, that Sure. Currently. Sure. So there are a lot. Um, I got into this role three and a half years ago when Miami-Dade County, City of Miami Beach, and Miami-Dade and City of Miami were awarded to become members of the 100 Resilient City Program, which was funded by Rockefeller. And we worked together because the oceans, the heat, they know no jurisdictional boundary, right? So, so we felt that it was really important that we work together on a unified resilience strategy. And we released that last May. We're going to be coming out with an update soon on update on actions of that strategy. That, the way Rockefeller looks at uh, the response is much broader that cities are facing resilience challenges, not only related to climate, but just increasing density and globalization. So, you know, this pandemic, for instance, is a great example of globalization at work um, and, and, and density, right? Um, so, um, so w cities are, are accumulators of increasing risks, whether they're acute shocks or chronic stresses, but also great hotbeds of innovation. So that's what Resilient 305 and Resilient305.com is where you can see that strategy. It's very holistic. It certainly has a lot around climate, but it is not just about climate, it's a lot about social equity concerns and public health concerns. Um, and uh, then Miami Beach has their Rising Above campaign. They've invested a lot in infrastructure and land use codes, et cetera. Uh, that I encourage you to go to their website, Miami Beach Rising Above to learn more about that. I can talk more in detail about the city's strategy, of course, because we, released that in January of this year, the Miami Forever Climate Ready Strategy, which is has five main goals. We created it, we got input from about 500, actually close to 600 residents through various neighborhood outreach, online outreach, uh, 
advisory panels, different stakeholder groups, et cetera. And um, our five goals are one, to make sure our decisions are really driven by data and, and human-centered so that we take all Miamians into account in our decision-making, um, but also that we, that we have a really robust data network. And that's why we're updating our stormwater master plan and taking sea level rise into account. We're doing this citywide mapping of heat islands so that as we design new streets, we design new seawalls, we're, we're using the best modeling of how to protect our property over the next 40 to 50 years. And that's really the time frame the strategy uses, mostly because that has um, a manageable level of uncertainty in terms of future projections, but also it's the life time of a lot of the infrastructure we'd be building today. Mm -hmm. So a seawall, for instance, will last you 40 to 50 years. So you don't want to design a seawall for 2100 because it's not going to last that long anyway. You're going to design it for 2070. And so, so really that's what we're advocating is land use changes and design of new infrastructure that takes the projections within that time frame into account. So we've data driven, we do a, a, a big campaign around more education and outreach. And we have a number of nonprofit community-based partners that we work with and support in that work. And then uh, our waterfront, we're updating our seawall and living shoreline type of design requirements, waterfront design guidelines, and uh, investing in the city-owned waterfront our infrastructure needs to be rethought, not only from a climate adaptation standpoint, but from a carbon mitigation standpoint. So how do we create transportation systems that are more, um, that are less carbon intensive, uh, you know, biking, pedestrian, public transit. Um, and with this COVID, how do we promote more teleworking, right? There's things that we're learning and that's one of the things we're involved in right now is the economic recovery planning post pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, what I'm trying to build into that long-term recovery is how do we use investments in resilient infrastructure to drive opportunities for businesses and local jobs? How do we think about what we're learning from this crisis that we want to hold on to that could keep our carbon emissions um, at a lower level. Uh, yeah. So, so that, that's, the, you know, you have to look at a crisis and try to leverage it as an opportunity as much as possible. But anyway, so infrastructure, then, then we, we also, and the last priority is really about working with private property owners, updating our land use and building codes, but also providing guidelines, maybe financing mechanisms to help residents adapt their property. Right now, we're working on a, a guide for uh, multi existing multifamily affordable housing to give them tools and uh, resources to retrofit their properties to be more resilient. So, so that's at Miami Forever Climate Ready. Uh, luckily, our Miami residents passed a bond two years ago, the Miami Forever Bond. Uh, and that has really given us a shot in the arm in terms of resources. It's 400 million to uh, close to 200 million is for flood risk mitigation and sea level rise mitigation, 100 million for affordable housing, and then the rest is parks and, and public safety. But be, we're building resilience into all that work. And so that's really helped us to um, take a plan and, and put it into implementation. Yeah. That is that is really amazing to hear all of that. And, and I'm kind of thinking, how is it that um, the general public, certainly parents and families uh, we're talking about in this conversation, how can they help move this forward? How can they help um, the cause with the city? I had the sure. same question. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, first, I, I, I encourage people to take a look at the plan and hold the city accountable to it, right? So, because 
we presented it in January and we're working on it, but we are going through an economic crisis. Priorities can change. Um, people can forget, and it's really important for our leadership, our elected leadership, to hear from residents that this this work is important. So, uh, you know, take a look. The, the, the actions are well thought through. They had a lot of input. So um, if you see something that isn't moving at at the pace that it should be, I think you should voice it. And, and I'm certainly happy to answer specific questions related to that. Another thing is, in fact, something people can do on Mother's Day this Sunday. <laughs> um, we're going to have some, unfortunately, it looks like it's going to be a rainy day. <laughs> so, um, and we're going to have rain next week. But we are in the process of doing these models for our stormwater master plan that are going to help us prioritize where to invest our infrastructure, both gray and green uh, infrastructure to help with managing water. And um, we need to validate those models, which means we need to have good reporting data on floods out there. So uh, I think in the chat, Eddie's going to share the link to our flood reporting tool. If you're in the city of Miami and you go out with your kids this weekend, you can help inform our stormwater master plan by taking photos and uploading them through that flood reporting tool. And we will, we will use that in, to inform our stormwater master plan. So that's one very clear short-term thing. Um, certainly there are, there are other citizen science things we do. Uh, we partner with FIU every year during the King Tides to measure the King Tides in the fall. Mm -hmm. And there'd be opportunities in that way. Um, there's a, yeah. So those are some thoughts of how people could be helpful. So I, can I just take, um, I wanted to say that, uh, Jane, you were talking about telecommuting. And yeah. what, what um, I don't think you did mention is that there's actually a really nice intersection uh, in parenting and the environment in the idea of telecommuting. And, um, you know, as our paradigm is shifting in COVID <laughs> to uh, embrace uh, familying as, or home domesticating, or, you know, being at home, it becoming yeah. relevant to work life. And hopefully that paradigm will shift as we come out of this moment, this quarantine moment. Um, right. But it's really interesting to look how also that um, you know, you're both parents doing your work as parents, as mothers. So um, I'm interested to hear you both respond to this idea of a world um, where you could, you know, be in your studio or your home studio and telecommuting in ways that you need to. Um, and Jane, you could be telecommuting, you know, like, like how as parents is that important because our kids inform our work. You know, you both spoke at the beginning about uh, being inspired to do the work you do, even though you were doing it before you had kids, it, suddenly there became this, uh, it became a higher stakes. Um, you know, so, so how do you see uh, telecommuting um, impacting what and how we can do for the environment and, and impacting our parenting? Like, sorry, for our practice, whether it's the environment or as an artist, and how that, um, how that is for our kids, how that's beneficial for our kids as well. Was that? You want, yeah, no, I get it. So um, I'll go first and then Sandra, you can yeah. chime in. So first, I just want to acknowledge that for parents with elementary age or younger kids at this time and they can't go to school, they're trying to juggle work and parenting from home has not actually been that easy. Uh, right. It's been been tough. I'm blessed that mine are in you know eighth and tenth grade, and they're pretty self sufficient. And so it's actually been lovely because I get to see them more. And I it's not about schlepping them to their various activities. It's about going for walks after work and things that um, we enjoy doing together. So. So for me, it's definitely been a quality of life booster, but I, I just want to acknowledge that it's not for everybody. 
Um, and that, you know, if we get back to a new normal, um, that might be different if kids are back in school. Uh, Thank you for acknowledging that it's not for everybody. And I guess, I guess what I also kind of mean is that this moment could perhaps inform the right. way we structure our culture and our work lives. Absolutely. No, and, and, and you know, it's, at the city, we're starting to design a new office building, right? And we have all put in our requests for how much office space we need, all the departments, et cetera. Well, they're rethinking that completely now because, because they've realized that maybe not everyone needs to be in the office all the time. And I directed my team to, we we're about to finish an updated greenhouse gas inventory, that this is a great time to analyze what's the difference of greenhouse gas emissions just for the city's carbon footprint. If a higher percentage of our, our um, employees were telecommuting, um, how does that benefit our carbon footprint? And, um, and, and how, how much could that? So we're gonna try to include that in our greenhouse gas update as a, just a additional way to try to push the idea of more flexibility. Because it, mm. it, it, there are a lot of people who can't afford to live in Miami that work in Miami and they have to commute just awful commutes. Yeah, right. It's, right. it's soul saving. Yeah. Um, you know, before COVID, I, I also direct a nonprofit organization called Project Art, which is a national organization, and we have a chapter here in Miami. So the majority of the work that I did um, was remote. You know, I, I have eight resident artists, and they would go to their libraries, respective libraries, and do their programming there. Um, you know, what Jane said, <laughs> at least for me, I do have two kids that are, um, you know, one's in fifth grade and one's in yeah. first. And, yeah. um, you know, it, it's, it's been a challenge. I mean, it's yeah. been really hard um, juggling, still working technically full time, you know, with project art. Um, and, and just last week, I had just finished teaching my college courses at New World and I was doing all of that through Zoom. Um, so that was really interesting as well. Um, but, you know, having the kids at home and, and working with them, um, you know, I'm, I'm really learning a little bit <laughs> more about myself. <laughs> I'm sort of, uh, retapping into, okay. Um, you know, that's one thing is being a teacher for college students. And another is now sort of being a homeschool mom and, working with my kids on projects, um, which I did before, you know, but granted, you know, the majority of the work is, is being done at home. And so um, it's been a little bit of a learning curve for me. <laughs> I definitely have had to check myself multiple times. Um, patience has been very limited at times, but at times it's been really fun, you know, doing some of the works and, and, you know, this sense of accomplishment. I feel a sense of accomplishment every time I submit something on Friday. <laughs> I feel like, yes, we did it. Um, but, it, um, you know, but it, it, it has been really hard. And I have a lot of friends that have kids, you know, the same age. And, you know, we have our little chat groups and we uh, basically vent to one another. <laughs> um, but, you know, like Jane said, I think this is definitely an opportunity um, for at least us as a family to take advantage of things like walking together. Um, we never really did that before. Um, and now we're doing it now. Um, me sitting outside watching the kids, you know, ride their bikes on the street. Um, that's something that, you know, I tried to do often as much as I could, but now it's more of a habit. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's been a little, Little bit of a juggling act now in terms of the creative process um i've had to sort of re-evaluate and revamp um my my the way that i was going to commit go into this new work um so you know now tomorrow i'm actually going to have an interview with three um, um 
project art students from our Cola Lakes Library. And, and I'm gonna see, I'm gonna see how the interview process through Zoom, um, you know, uh, informs the work and, and hopefully is part of, you know, will be part of the, the end um, um, process, so. Yeah, um, I also had another question uh, for Jane um, yeah. in regards to what Catherine had said and Catherine and I were sort of like same on the same wavelength on what we as residents can do to sort of help the city's mission. Um, but I'm also interested in hearing um, maybe your suggestions for uh, parents or abuelos and abuelas and tios uh, with children and, and what we can do or what kind of habits we can um, begin to adopt in sure. order to sort of help, you know, again, sustain and, and move the mission of the city forward. That's great. So, you know, this COVID-19 has brought us a big focus on home, right? So we're, I'm gonna start with home because that's where we are. And there's so much we can do to reduce our impact on the environment from, from home. Um, you know, there's simple things of just thinking about turning off lights when you're not using them and, 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 and keeping your AC higher than as high as you can tolerate or, and, and not keeping it low when you're not there. Or, um, you know, I always uh, raise it up in during the day and, and it's lower at night to make sure that I'm not, you know, all the, the kids aren't leaving the doors open and we're ACing the backyard, things like simple things like that. A lot of people don't know you can wash your clothes in cold water and you get just as good results. It protects your clothes, but it saves a huge amount in energy. And, um, and so I encourage people to do that. Uh, actually using a dishwasher is more efficient than hand washing. So that's a good thing for us all. <laughs> um, those are simple things. Changing out light bulbs to LED can save a huge amount on your electric bill. Not only because it reduces the amount of electricity for the light itself, but other light bulbs give off a lot of heat and that means your AC has to work that much harder. So, so they, can, they can really save a huge amount um, on that. Mm -hmm. There are programs to finance retrofits on your house through, uh, through Y-Green and other uh, property assess clean energy programs. Um, those, you, you know, you have to be a good consumer and ask all the right questions, make sure you can pay for it and all that. Um, but, but those are options. Dream and Green actually, which is uh, one of the organizations I helped start and they do a lot of environmental education uh, in schools, about a hundred schools across Miami, but uh, they also are now providing all sorts of actions you can do at home with your kids. They have all sorts of lessons and ideas. They suggest this iNaturalist app where you can document nature in your own backyard or in around public right of in your neighborhood. I encourage people to do, do those kind of things. Just take notice of what you're seeing in terms of nature. Some, some people are seeing things they haven't seen out in nature uh, because of less boats on the water or less, less airplanes in the air, or less cars on the road. You know, there's, there's, there's new, new things that people have seen. I've seen um, fish I hadn't seen in the bay and, 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 and dolphins. So that's been nice to see. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some things I think about. I think it's important to fall in love in, with, it, with nature as much as do something about it. So getting out and enjoying it uh, really helps build that commitment to doing something about it. So uh, those are things that people can do at home. And then uh, there are a number of organs. I mentioned Dream and Green that has both activities at home, but also all sorts of uh, ideas for schools uh, 
Clio Institute provides uh, training for high school students to become climate educators and climate activists. So they do some great work on that front. Frost Science has a program, Museum Volunteers for the Environment. And I've done that with my kids where we go out on Virginia Key and planted um, sea oats and helped restore areas. We've taken out invasives, we've planted mangroves, and the kids have really enjoyed that and they've come back and seen what they've planted and been really proud of it. Um, and that that's a beautiful, um, it, that's a really beautiful thing. In fact, my, my son took that and then has gone and planted mangroves in Morningside Park <laughs> and, and, and watches them grow. So, so that's been nice. Um, uh, another thing I've done with my kids is this uh, Sea Level Solutions Day in the fall with FIU to measure king tides. Uh, we're going to be coming out, we have a partnership with an organization that's going to be new to Miami called I See Change that is going to be a way to document how you see change, particularly flooding and, and flood events. Um, and so I will be pushing that out through uh, various groups uh, soon. You'll be hearing more about that, but that'll be another way that people can engage on issues and provide the city real data that we'll use. Yeah, thank you for that. I know that um, David just posted on that note some um, of the organizations and their links in the, in the chat so you can find more resources there. Sorry, Sandra, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say that it's interesting that you had uh, mentioned about the, the mangroves. Um, we recently did a little mini partnership with um, Javier Cortada and Cortada uh -huh. Projects, uh -huh. um, where he was doing the mango, uh, the plant project, sorry, um, yeah. in all the different libraries and some, and they came to some of our project art classes. So my my kids actually were able to take some mangroves and we have them potted in a in a little in a little pot right now. We have them planted, sorry. And I, I you know, that's some information that I had never never knew that mangroves i always knew that i always thought that mangroves just grew in you know the keys or something because that's where you know we, we right. so often but i didn't realize that you can actually plant them in the ground <laughs> and yeah. that they'll grow um so that was really neat you know just so, so sandra and jane and, and everybody i'm i'm uh so i'm david mcdougall a co-founding member of the miami climate alliance but i'm so happy that um We've gotten a number of people to join us today, including um, Tora Bueno, who um, I asked to join us, who's with one of the organizations that we've uh, posted links for, and that's um, Climate Parents, based here in Miami. And I'm understanding that that's a bridge between Sierra Club and Clio Institute and Dream and Green and some other things, but maybe Tora, you could uh, share just a little bit about what you all do and how people can get involved. Mm. So um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm a parent of a 14-year-old and an 11-year-old. And like um, the other moms, I was also very concerned. And so I found this campaign, which is a distributed campaign from the Sierra Club. And it gets in, I, you might have heard of the Ready for 100 campaign that they do, which moves whole cities to 100% or gets cities to commit to going moving to 100% clean energy. So this is a school district um, version of that. Wow. And Climate Parents has had a lot of success. They had a commitment from LA Unified, which is, I think it's the second largest school district. And Miami-Dade is the fourth largest school district. So mm -hmm. it's just about scaling up what you're trying to do. Like talking, we were just talking about personal actions and which in if everyone takes part that's wonderful but um miami-dade schools it's the fourth largest school district in the country and we have 400 school room i mean uh, school uh, schools buildings mm -hmm. um last year i think it, they spent about 65 million dollars on energy and electricity with fpl and um they're, I don't know exactly what the kilowatts would be, but um, they they pay about seven cents a kilowatt hour. And uh, they are working very hard. They haven't expressed an interest, not an interest, they've expressed a commitment to 
going solar because here clean energy is solar and they have talked a lot about as a school board they have talked a lot about installing solar um, parking lots and on their walkways um, so this campaign is aimed at helping the school board move towards that which is already stuff they're already doing. They are working very hard on, on energy conservation, which is the first step before you actually move to a clean energy source. Okay. Um, so that's what we're doing. And, um, and it's with the backing of the CR Club. So the CR Club has wonderful resources. That's amazing to hear. What a, what a fantastic yeah. effort. Yeah, and we need more parents, more parents, teachers, students, whoever is interested. Um, we have some great high school students who are helping out and we, you don't even have to be a parent. <laughs> there are people who are not parents who are interested. Mm -hmm. So it's still in the kind of nascent stage here, but, um, but it isn't in the nascent stage in, in the rest of the country. There are more developed campaigns, but Miami-Dade has, um, every city has its own uh, quirks. And I was interested, I am interested in talking to Jane um, or asking Jane, I guess, about, I, a long time ago, I did read the um, 305 Resilient document online. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I found it fascinating because there were, there were things in there that, I, that seemed very abstract to me. But um, I, I'm wondering how you bridge the good ideas and then to the action. Like, like, how do you get the political, how do you get, how do you go from the suggestions and the information and the data collecting and the, the, the knowledge to actual action here on those things? And you said that there's going to be a, um, a follow up document. Yeah, there's going to be an update document. I think it'll be out next month. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, just to talk about our progress for year one actions. Um, so it'll be mostly focused on those actions that we said we were gonna work on in the first year, but there are some updates of other actions. And it really, to answer your question, it's a little hard because every action's a little different, right? So um, for instance, you know, on EV infrastructure, because you sounds like you're very interested in the carbon mitigation stuff. So EV infrastructure, the city's been working on um, advancing policy related to requiring EV chargers in all new construction. It's gotten held up with this crisis because we can't have our planning and zoning board uh, virtually for some reason, I don't know. They, they aren't allowing that. So it's getting held up, but it's it's moving forward. Um, we've installed charging stations at all our, our um, major parking facilities. And I know the county's done some work on that front as well. Uh, we're partnered with the um, county on the Building Efficiency 305 program. And we're trying to um, engage stakeholders right now about a po proposed policy to require large buildings to track their energy and water usage and report it publicly through Energy Star Portfolio, the EPA's Energy Star Portfolio, so that that creates sort of a market of accountability. And it'd be great to get parents involved in advocating for this because we're gonna need stakeholder support. So, so that is basically, you know, like when you buy an appliance or a car, you get an efficiency rating, right? Well, this would be the same as if you were leasing a new apartment or buying a house, you know, buy, not buying a house because these are larger facilities, but leasing an apartment, leasing an office space, um, buying a condo, you would be able to see what the efficiency rating of that building is. So, so I, I, uh, I love the idea of that. Is there a way to make that sort of thing a mandatory, like, like um, yeah, that's what we're working towards. That's, and that's what we're working towards. Um, right now, we're doing all the stakeholder engagement of, you know, the building managers association, all the uh, property managers through the downtown development authority. We're we're trying to engage people first and 
help them understand what it would take. We're working with FPL because one of the challenges is that the FPL has all these individual accounts for condo yeah. buildings or apartment buildings, lease. So they would the the building owner would have to agree to work with FPL on getting the aggregated building data and anonymized so that it doesn't mess with people's privacy. So we're, we're doing a pilot with 31 buildings with FPL on that right now so that we can figure out that system so that it's not um, uh, cost prohibitive for a, a property owner to participate or you know labor intensive. So, so can I ask you something else, which seems, I, I think bringing it back to what I think the purpose of the, the meeting was, um, yeah. a little bit uh, the way parenting, becoming a parent, uh, somebody once described it as, I think it was my mom actually described it to me as like, you have a tray and you put everything, you organize everything on your tray, that's your life. And then you become a parent and it's like, you take the tray, you throw it in the air <laughs> and you catch whatever you can that's coming down. Like you, as it's coming down, you try to catch what you can. So I feel a little bit, it's funny, but right? It's, that's how it felt to me anyways. Um, I feel a little bit like COVID-19 has kind of done that for us, for like how we think about these things. Like, so yeah. when, you're, when we're discussing like um, the problems of, of affordable housing in Miami, and commuting i have known people who commute two hours i know people commute three hours it's insanity um and so i um am wondering if they are essential workers just having less traffic on the road if we do more telecommuting is going to help and um if you, when when i've watched the clio um, presentations they often have a picture of the 826 you know full of traffic and I'm wondering like, mm -hmm. how, how can we learn, how can we really take advantage of this throwing our tray of stuff up into the air and figure out uh, what we keep and what we leave of our, pot, our plans for, for fixing the environment from before? So I actually am gonna interrupt. I'm sorry to do that to you, um, Tora. Um, but we're actually at time and I just want to, even though we're at time, I want to see if it's possible for us to have a few closing words very briefly from Sandra and Jane, just in generally, uh, in general about the topic at the juxtaposition of the arts and, um, and, and climate action or policy or advocacy. Um, Either of you have any? Yeah. <laughs> Well, Tora, I, I, I just want to say, Tora, I totally am on board with the question that you asked, and I hope that there is something that we all learn from all of this. Um, and I feel, um, you know, as, as an artist, um, I think that this is a really great opportunity to use art as a platform for education, for expression, for healing, um, you know, especially now, you know, a, a, as an outlet, right? Um, which is why I also kind of want to invite all the parents um, or, you know, individuals that might be participating in this chat that might know kids that might want to be a part of this um, research and perhaps a part of my, my work. Um, they can email me um, or they can go to my website, sandraportal.com, uh, um, and reach out to me. But I'm, I'm really interested in in having that opportunity to speak with kids in the community, um, you know, about this very issue and perhaps having them draw uh, something based on the conversations that we have. So this is more, so it'll be a, a little bit of a, a nice way for them to express themselves, but also have a, a little bit of healing as well through um, artistic expression. So. Um, I think right now that's really kind of like the hat that I'm um, wearing is like, how do we heal, you know, and art for me is one of those outlets. Jane? <laughs> sure. I agree. Art is definitely an outlet for, for healing, for expression. And um, I, I, Tora's comment I think it's really important to um, 
look at it in this current context of the COVID crisis and how do we, how do we um, make sure that when we think about getting back to some sort of new normal, that we, we don't just go back, right? We think about how do we build a more resilient recovery that, that takes these climate impacts into account, whether it's, it's thinking about teleworking policies or thinking about um, how do we more rapidly build more affordable housing and, and create jobs as a result? You know, how do we, how do we think and, and make sure that housing is efficient, right? And maybe even has solar. Um, so, so I think, I think the more um, we can, uh, arts are healing, but there also can be advocacy. And so, so making sure that our elected leaders hear people's concerns is really important. And um, because, you know, it, it, it's often those loud voices, the loudest voices that get heard and responded to. Yeah, thank you for that, Jane and Sandra and everyone who's been on this call. Um, I think, you know, what you said that the arts are healing, but advocacy is, is also needed. That's, that's kind of one of the, the benefits of the arts is to provide that platform and to really open the door for a larger community to become part of the conversation and have access to the community on the ground um, mobilization that is happening around this issue. So I think the arts can be a partner in that advocacy. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So. I just want to say thank you again. If you all want to learn about Sandra's project, it's really um, exciting work that she's uh, developing, working with kids and, and um, featuring their voices and their, their thoughts on this issue in her piece. Um, that will premiere sometime next year. <laughs> COVID has kind of thrown our timeline off. We'll see where it ends up. It was going to be next spring, and hopefully we'll still find a way to do that for next spring. But um, you can always find out the latest with NBCLiveArts.org. You can always contact us and ask, or at Sandra's website, which she also posted. Um, and Jane, a million thanks for what you're doing um, in the city of Miami and whatever you need. You know, I mean, I'm sure you have uh challenges everywhere you look so um Thank I know you. there's so get many out people there in and report Miami. floods this weekend get out there and report some floods on sunday <laughs> so That's wherever fun. you know people lo yeah, is, I, I know in miami a million people want to see this change happen so um you know however we can be part of that is, is fantastic. So mm -hmm. thank you for letting us know about those resources and actions people can take. Sure. Thank you everybody for participating. Do check out those links about organizations that you can become involved with. And we'll see you at our next event. Uh, we're having a series of climate chats like these around the arts and, and climate crisis. Um, next week on the 13th, actually, we have, we're partnering with um, NYU Abu Dhabi, the Arts Center to do a rebroadcast of a fantastic performance that we did here in 2015 called Holocenes, which is all about sea level rise, that subject that we know and uh, feel so closely here. Um, so you can check that out on our Facebook Live on the 13th next week at 1.30. Um, and uh, stay in touch, everybody. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Sandra. Great job, everybody. Thank you. Virtual Thanks, applause. Eddie. Yay. <laughs> Yay.